Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Driving Forces. I'm James Milan. Um, Driving Forces is an ACMI public affairs series that focuses on uh, those uh, in our community and in this area who choose to spend some, a lot, or maybe even all of their time uh, on some form of social activism or social welfare activity of some sort. And I have a great example of that uh, here today joining me. And she is Arlington resident, Jean Sicarella, who runs a nonprofit that we're about to hear a whole bunch about uh, called Misión de Caridad. And I am actually going to well, first of all, welcome Eugene. And thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much me. for joining us in the studio today. Um, you know, you're joining us on one of your three-week stints in the Arlington area versus your one week every month, more or less, average of being down on the border. So, all right, people are going to be wondering, what is he talking about? Uh, let's start, though, when we'll get to the work of Misión de Caridad. That's where mm -hmm. we'll spend most of our time. But... Um, we, this series also likes to focus on just kind of, okay, what motivated you to get into this work? What is the cost of the work for you? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and of course, what do you, what do you get from it? Um, we really like to highlight this, but also to kind of share with other people your particular story um, so that they can, you know, derive either information, inspiration, or something else from it. Yeah, great. So if you don't mind, let's start off by just talking a little bit about you. Um, I mentioned that you're an Arlington resident, so yeah. how long has that been the case? And you know, what's the situation? I know you have a family. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your own personal situation. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Newton, Massachusetts, and never thought I was going to stay around. I went to school in Syracuse, and then when I came back, I came back to this area, and I was a girl that was moving to California. In my mind, I was out of here. But I met my now husband, um, and then that ended moving because he's <laughs> from Burlington, Mass. So we ended up being locals. And uh, I had never really heard of Arlington, but he had. So after we got married, we moved here, and that was in 1995. So we have basically been married since 1995 and living in Arlington. So whatever, however many years that is, that's mm -hmm. how long I've been here. Well, interestingly enough, 1995 is when my wife and I and our children moved here to Arlington. Okay. So it's a it's a serendipitous year, I would say. Yeah. Um, we've been really happy um, to be here for the you know 20, 26 years and counting uh, that we've been, and and clearly you guys as well. And so you moved here, had a family, you know, have a job. My understanding is you've got. Not not one or two. I have two children. Yeah, you're, you're beating me. I have five. <laughs> yeah. So my children are the youngest is 16 now, and the oldest is 27. And so we live over by the lakes area of Arlington. So over by the Mystic Lake. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful area of Arlington to live. And uh, we also have a, a house big enough for that many children. So we only have now two living at home. Two are in college, but one of the college students lives at home, mm -hmm. and then the other is at Assumption University. We have a graduate from Lesley University and a graduate from Stonehill College. Great. Yeah. And, you know, part of why I was wondering about this is, again, we're, we want to know, really, it, we want to kind of dig into, okay, you know, you make a decision like starting a nonprofit like this, and you've, you've got some number of children that you're, are, that you, that you're taking care of still, um, and obviously, even when they're out of the house, yeah. <laughs> it's what's the cost to them? Yeah. 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 Or what's the cost to them and what's the cost to you yeah. in terms of that relationship? So I think we can go ahead and, and maybe fold that into the conversation mm -hmm. um, that we have about the work that you have chosen to do. Great. Um, okay. So let's let's go ahead and, and, and talk about how Misión de Caridad has come into existence. So Tell us what the work of the organization is, yep. and then take us back to the origin story for okay. it. Okay. So Misión de Caridad is basically focused in Mexico, helping women and children, migrants, internally displaced people, and refugees become independent and self-sufficient in Mexico, free of extreme poverty, 
violence, and persecution. So really our job is to help people Just stay, that, huh? That's just all? That, that's <laughs> it, yeah, free of, free of poverty alone is like, wait, what? How are you going to do that, right? And so, you know, as you know, there's a lot of refugees where their goal is to come to the United States. And so for those people, they pass through and we help them where we can. So in that case, we might provide clothing, we might provide some kind of aid, maybe a lot of times we'll do like an ice cream social. And largely it's for the children and the women who are just, they've been displaced for so long in their journey to get to the United States that when they get to the border of Mexico, having something that could just cause them to relax, a party or something like that, really helps them. But we know that their focus is the United States. They're not staying in Mexico. They have no desire to stay in Mexico. So we don't put a whole lot of energy into helping them stay in Mexico. However, there's a whole other group of people, we call them internally displaced. Um, they come from somewhere else, oftentimes southern Mexico, but other times from other places. Mm -hmm. Their goal is Mexico. They come to the border because they can earn maybe a better wage, it feels safer to them, and so they want to put down roots there. And we're providing programs and helping them become self-sufficient on the Mexico side of the U.S. border. Um, you know, I have to just note that it's, it's very interesting to think about what kinds of situations people are coming from yeah. that would make the border and the border area, as a lot of Americans understand it, feel like a safe place, mm. uh, relatively speaking, for them. And that's, you know, again, a, a question we might be able to delve into a little yeah, bit more sure. as, as this conversation goes on. But that is a, uh, I'm sure our audience would agree, an ambitious quite an ambitious uh, slate of services uh, to be looking to provide to quite a large number of people. Yeah. Um, so again, how on earth? <laughs> yeah, how did, did I get, get there? Yeah, how did you get decide to take this kind of thing on? Yeah, well, you know, what's interesting about that is I did not set out to take this on, as many people often say, but yet I feel like I've been prepared my whole life to do it. So I look at the skills that it caught what I need to draw upon in order to run Misión de Caridad. And I feel like through my entire career, through my entire personal life, I've been working towards this. So it's really amazing now to be able to use all these different skill sets that I've developed in order to be able to make a difference. So how did I get here would be that I went on a missions trip back in 2016 with High Rock Church, the youth of High Rock Church, to this area in Mexico. San Luis, Rio, Colorado, okay. in Sonora, Mexico. It's, it's, okay, good. Let, we should situate it. It's in Sonora. And for people whose geography of the U.S. <laughs> is better than, it, than their Mexican geography, which I expect is a lot of, yeah. of us. Yeah, where, where is it? Yeah. Yeah, so if you go to San Diego, basically the, the Tijuana border is right there, cross over the border and head east. Go for about three hours, maybe a little bit longer, and you will run through our town. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to Phoenix and you can go southwest, and if you just basically go straight down about three and a half hours, again, you'll land at our border crossing, which is basically at Yuma, Arizona, or San Luis, Arizona. Okay. So we border Arizona right. on the Mexico so, side. So further to the west of Mexico than, the, you know, the, than those places, Juarez, et cetera, that, that, are Mexi or that are Texas or yep. New Mexico. And we're considered a border adjacent. crossing. We're mm -hmm. not a huge town. Um, but we're a town of a good amount of people, about mm -hmm. the size for those local here, many people. It's about the size of Worcester, but not the population of Worcester. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so basically I went on this missions trip, and we, were, we, were, we went there in order to be able to serve this church, who Francisco, my co-founder, actually is pastor of. And he worked for the MERGE, the organization MERGE, which helped facilitate the trip that allowed us to go. Okay. And so now here we are in Mexico and we did all kinds of work. We did painting, we did projects, um, and we spent the week there. And while I was there, there was something about being there that I felt like I needed to be there and I didn't know why, but I did make mental note to myself that it felt like home and I really needed to go back, but I couldn't tell you why. Mm -hmm. And so my family and I, mostly my children, but my husband as well, went back about three more times before I started Misión de Caridad, maybe even four, for no reason other than to get to know the people that were there. And we didn't do any service. We didn't do anything special. If anything, we went on vacation there, which, again, for a frame of reference, is the desert. So it's not really a place you go on vacation. We're not talking right. water. Right. We're talking it's 100. No zip and, lines. No, yeah, no, no, no. No, 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 none of that kind of no, vacation. No, we're talking like 115 in the summer can be as hot mm -hmm. as that, even hotter, mm -hmm. uh, and as cold as 40s in the winter. And our 40 feels warm. 
their 40 feels bitter cold. So it, it's a different type of 40 because it is dry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject again and just say that, uh, you know, I think it's, it, 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 it's saying some, a little something about yourself and what a force of nature you might be, that you, that your family and your children accompanied you back <laughs> there multiple occasions when I'm sure it wasn't them that was <laughs> saying, Mom, can we please go? Yeah. Uh, but instead, clearly something was drawing you there. And, uh, and you decided to rope that, the, your whole family into yeah. it. Well, it's the people too. I mm -hmm. mean, we didn't just fall, we didn't fall in love with the place, right? You can't really fall in love with 115 degrees in the summer. But the people in the culture is what I think they fell in love with. People that cared about each other, family that was tight and close together, that wanted to spend time together. I think that was attractive to them. And it certainly was attractive to me because it's how we always operated as a family. Hence, a point why my family would be like, oh, sure, we'll go. Let's all go together because I think that's the culture of my family. And so I think they've deviated towards that culture as well other places. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So, so that's what was happening for a while. Yes. Um, and then what, what changed? What, what made vacations yeah. um, to the area turn into something else? So at the end of 2018, our policies at the U.S. border changed. And at that point, we were doing something called metering, where when refugees came to the border, now, or now we have Title 42, but before the pandemic, someone could just seek asylum and they could cross into the United States in order to seek asylum. But what happened was they had to wait in line. And that line initially was truly a line where you basically waited in line for days and weeks, but it turned into months of waiting. Mm -hmm. And so people then were stuck at the border living in encampments, um, and a lot of women and children were very vulnerable. And so I was still obviously in communication with my friends in Mexico, and this pastor Francisco, Francisco Ortega, who's my co-founder, was texting me one day and he said, you know, I think I want to start a GoFundMe to help women and children. And I mean, it was funny, you could almost see in the text, my eyes light up. <laughs> and I was like, he's like, I want to open a home to help a few people. And I was like, but well, what if we opened more of a facility? What if we helped like lots of people? What if we opened a center? And what if we did and then fill in the blanks, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that started Misión de Caridad. And Francisco and I then started meeting basically on a weekly basis, talking through what is this like for you? What are you thinking? What am I thinking? And in June, we officially formed Misión de Caridad and set up a nonprofit. So that would have been June of 2019? 2019. Uh -huh. yeah, 2019. So a couple of years ago and a, yeah. and a little bit. Not that long in no, terms of not that uh, long. what you've been able to accomplish. But it sounds like, again, maybe we shouldn't be surprised about that because it sounds to me, like what, from what you just said, that Francisco had this in mind. <laughs> and you said, oh, how about that? <laughs> um, and, you know, yeah. there you go. It's a little bit of my personality, for mm -hmm. sure. It's like I am one of those people that like to do. And so I don't feel it like an obstacle. It's not like you can't some obstacles can't be overcome, but I think I have the mindset of not seeing things as obstacles, but more, okay, we can make this work, and then looking for solutions to make things work. And I will note that years ago here in Arlington, I started um, High Rock Covenant Preschool right down the street, mm -hmm. and we grew, to be, we grew to be, I think, 70 students at, at one point. Um, and, okay, we didn't like uh, we may not even have time for the conversation yeah we don't have to about talk that. about that. But the point yeah. is just that like I didn't know anything about preschools, but yet I think that was equipping me. I had to start a nonprofit, run a nonprofit, right? And I learned so much that then could transfer to the work of Misión de Caridad. Yeah, you know, before in, in other conversations you and I have had before we came on camera, you know, you you have spoken as you alluded to um, in, in this conversation to the fact that it doesn't feel like you chose this; it feels like it chose yeah. you in a sense, and yeah. that you can now kind of look back and see how a bunch of decisions that you had made in in a, within specific parameters all seem to have prepared you, as you say, to for for this particular challenge. Yeah, yeah. I liken myself as a piece on a chessboard. And what piece I am depends on what role I'm playing. And so I might be a pawn, and I may only be able to go forward two spaces, and that's it. I might be the, what's the rook that gets to go sideways, mm -hmm. or I might be the bishop that gets to jump this way. And that my role dictates how I move on a chessboard, but I'm willing to go where my role is. Mm -hmm. And so if I have to move all over the chessboard and be the queen to move, then I'll be that. If my role is to go diagonal, then I'll move diagonal. Wow, that's that's a, that, that's a 
you know, I, I, I think I'm going to kind of practice with that little metaphor yeah. myself. It's kind my of life. fun it's to think fun. about that, right? Yeah. You, you, you go in the direction of which you're called to go and you, you become the piece that you're called to be. So in Mexico, I have a different role sometimes. Yeah, right? I just I, wanted to ask about that, so please go ahead. Yeah, so when I'm in Mexico, right, Francisco takes the lead. And so then I look at Francisco and I, I have to be careful that I don't come in with my ways, right? It's a different culture. So, you know, my way would be to charge in and say, oh, how are you doing things? Oh, we could do it this way and we could do it faster or, but you know, faster isn't necessarily better, you know, because the teams that we're working with are building community while they're serving, while mm -hmm. they're volunteering. We have about 40 volunteers. Yeah, let's talk about that because you had mentioned that in terms of refugees, how it is that you're able to serve them, which is, again, it's a very transitory kind of relationship, and you're helping them to have a, a, a better, nicer, um, more, you know, one with more cheer in it uh, experience as they are, you know, waiting to move on to their ultimate destinations. So what is it that you do for the other populations that, that you work with, and yep. how do you do it? You were just mentioning you have quite quite a, a good sized workforce down yeah, there. Yeah, we do. How does it all happen? So we have a number of programs. So our flagship program is what's called our Feed a Family program. And what Feed a Family was, it really was born out of the pandemic where a lot of people were out of work and they couldn't afford to feed their families. And so we deliver basically 60 packages to 60 families of two weeks of healthy groceries. So we identified what we considered to be the most healthy groceries, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, eggs, milk, and we identify families based on where they live in the communities that they live. So we call them different names. We have a community called Besitos because the first time we went there, the girl had a shirt on that said Besitos, this cute little girl. Mm -hmm. Another one is coffee because the gentleman there offered us, a man in that community offered us coffee. <laughs> so now that's the coffee community. So we have different names for our communities. And we know that they're in poverty because of how they live. Many people don't live inside their homes, and their homes are basically little structures. Some are made of wood, like pallets and uh, cardboard. Some are made of mattresses or doors or scrap wood or you name it. Whatever they found, that's what they've constructed their home out of. But picture being in a home with no windows, and it's 115 degrees, and at night it's 100 degrees. You can't really li live inside. And so oftentimes, um, what we'll see is people will live outside of their homes. They have outhouses, they can't cook inside, they cook outside. So there are lots of markers of extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. And so we will go into these communities and we'll ask around for who has children. And what we look, who we look to deliver to is women who have children who are in need. And then we've learned through, through going now for, the, for what, well over a year, which communities need us the most, which families in the community lead us to most, the most. And also people lead us to other people. So when we say one family, they say, oh, there's a family like two blocks down, you should go see them. So we drive around, the roads are all dirt. Mm -hmm. It's hot during the day when we're delivering. We try to deliver after like two o'clock, three o'clock or so. And we go door to door. And we Sounds deliver the like food. Sounds like a really organic way to, to grow, you know, the, again, the constituencies that you serve uh, there. And, and also one that I imagine is some kind of combination of the vision and the, the, the working out of how you were going to do things between you and Francisco from the beginning. Yep. And then also just kind of reacting to, like you said, that, that, that chessboard analogy again. You know, you might start off as one piece and then find that in order to do this other thing, you need to turn into a different piece. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys are have been kind of agile as, a, as an organization in that way. And we've had to be. So what we basically do is we look at the community and we say, what are the needs of the community and how can we help them? So the, during the pandemic, really it was, how do we keep them alive? Right, so we, dist we distributed blankets, we distributed clothing, masks, different types of PPE that a community needed books for children, but a lot of these kids couldn't go to school because school was online, it required the internet, well many don't have electricity, so school is not really an option. So what we did was we went down in March of last year and we had a medical fair. 
And that allowed us to, again, go into the community, have people come through, and we gave each of them an appointment. They showed up at their designated time. We saw well over 100 people, and we started to assess what their situation was. We asked them a bunch of questions about their kids, about schooling, about vaccines. Um, we took their weight, their height. We assessed their blood sugar, blood pressure. We did a dental checkup. Right? We did all of these things, and what we learned was that 80% of the population was obese. The most of the people in the communities we serve earn less than $50 a week. Some earn $100, but no one earns more than $100 a week. So it's really somewhere mm. in $100 and under. Um, we learned that there was a lot of consumption of sugar and high-fat foods. And we learned that kids had a ton of cavities, and they weren't brushing their teeth at all. So that's at a high level what we learned. And then what we've done is we've developed programs to address those needs. That's the self-sufficiency part. If all we do is deliver food, well, that's not really going to help you escape poverty. But if we start addressing root causes of things that inhibit your ability to work, your education level, your health, your, the fact that if you're missing teeth, you know, there's only so many jobs you can get when you don't have your teeth, right? We do still have a culture of people that, that judge people based on their appearances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so now we have a lot of different programs. We have a weight loss challenge where women have a walking program in the mornings. They do aerobics on Sundays. We gave out walking shoes and mats so they could do exercises at home. We have a dental program that teach kids how to brush. That's a lot of fun. I mean, teaching kids how to brush teeth, it, it's hysterical, you know? So we put these programs in place. We have an Every Kid in School program where we're removing the barriers that impede parents' ability to send their kids to school. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out what's stopping them from sending their kids to school. How do we break down those barriers so we can get every kid in school? It's, it is a, uh, you know, tr truly an admirable kind of, not only task that you have taken on or, or calling in a sense or mission, mm. uh, but again, the way that you're going about it, it seems like you are, it seems like a good efficient use of the resources that you have mm. available and, and a good, again, push-pull between what you are willing to provide and go out and find for these populations and what they're telling you yeah. they want and need, um, either you know, either overtly telling you or telling you because you can look around and see what the issues are. It becomes are. obvious, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so and, that's uh, yeah. clearly, um, you know, I, I have to say, I knew this conversation was going to fly by, and it is. Uh, we've got probably five minutes or so left, okay. so not too much time. But I'm wondering, um, you know, pausing to consider what how much you've been able to accomplish in just over two years. Mm. And again, anybody who's just listened to the last five minutes of, of you speaking must realize that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, how do you see things looking, you know, projecting forward uh, for, the, for another two or four or 10 or 30, I don't know, well, uh, years? Yeah, I need to say, I mean, this is the point where I should probably inject, and it's important to have in here, that I'm a woman of faith. And I really believe that everything that we've needed at Mission de Caridad has been provided to us. Donors have been provided just what we need, when we need it, the knowledge we need, the resources we need. So it is a gift. It's so, it's so humbling to see and be a recipient of what we need when we need it, because that's allowed us to do what we've done. And yes, it comes at a cost. Last night I was on the phone through a Zoom call for three hours with Francisco. This is a very common occurrence. We meet at least twice a week, and there are multiple hours. And many times my kids are, okay, when are you getting off? They have something to say, or they want to have a conversation. So it, it does come with that kind of sacrifice. Um, but I feel like it's gratifying, and my family is a part of it. They are various times have gone down to the border with me and served alongside me, and that is wonderful. My husband is extremely supportive. So where we're going as an organization, we're going to continue to add programs and grow. And our goal is if we can master in one community, we'll move to another community, we'll move farther down the border, and we'll continue offering these services and try to help people become self-sufficient. And one of the programs is through work programs as well. Where we want to be offering programs to help women earn more, a better income. Because how are you going to escape poverty if you're not earning more than $50 a week? And so that's another program that we've been working on. Well, you know, I, we, we mentioned at the outset that you do spend an average of, I understand that you don't go down every single month for a week, but you, you, you do it, you know, many times Pretty every year. Pretty consistently, yeah. Um, and 
uh, again, to bring that back, how does that affect your life here? You're, you're trying to do this work from Arlington, Massachusetts a certain yeah. amount of the time, yeah. thousands, literally thousands of miles away from the site at which you're providing the services. Um, and of course you are present there, you know, yeah. quite regularly. Yeah. But, you know, again, both on the level of what does it cost you and mm -hmm. how do you actually, like, is it, is it the, the fact that there is Zoom? that allows you to, you know, yep. kind of be able to operate as if you were. Yep, Zoom um, and Francisco and his team, right? Mm -hmm. Because I c if I'm not there, the work goes on, right? Francisco has 40 volunteers, there's staff there that are implementing these programs. And my value in going down there is to be a part of the organization, understand the needs and work with Francisco to think, okay, what else, what can we build in next? What can we do next? So he and I are constantly brainstorming, how do we implement the next program? And me being there helps me to see and formulate firsthand what that might be. But while I'm here, there's still going, work is still going on there. That, you know, that, that makes sense, but I still, I think we're gonna, you know, we're gonna basically just keep checking in with you, Jane, yeah. over, <laughs> over the course of the next, uh, yeah. the next while and see how things evolve because um, I, I know your kids are getting older and, you know, clearly you've figured out how to do it up till now. Yes. Um, so I'm sure that that will continue. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it is intriguing to, to realize or, or to try and figure out just how somebody in your position and in this life gets so much done um, yeah. about something that is, again, at quite a remove from our direct experience here. Yeah. Anyway, more power to you oh, for you. not only taking it on, but doing it clearly well, and, um, and I guess for the long haul. Yeah, it's for the long haul for sure. Yeah, in it for the long haul. Yeah. All right. Well, her organization is Misión de Caridad. She is Jean Sicarella, a Arlington resident, and wow, font of much energy and <laughs> innovation, clearly. Um, we do look forward to speaking to Jean again further in a, in a future iteration of Driving Forces. But for now, we'll say thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'm James Milan. This has been Driving Forces. We'll see you next time.